Hi class and welcome to the final lecture of the semester on the urinary system. Uh, there's two parts to this. We'll see how much we get through in this lecture. Uh, the main function of your kidneys, which is a main, um, which is your body's main excretory organ, is to maintain your body's internal environment by regulating total water volume and total solute concentration in the water, regulating the ion concentrations in all the fluid exterior to the cells, ensuring long-term acid-base balance in the pH, excreting all the metabolic wastes, toxins, drugs, um, anything that a urine test would pick up when you get tested um, before you take a job, for example, producing erythropoietin, which regulates red blood cell production, and renin, which will regulate blood pressure. So that's a mistake on this slide. Um, erythropoietin and renin should just be switched around because erythropoietin is the hormone that creates red blood cells and renin will be the hormone that helps to regulate blood pressure. Your, your kidneys also activate vitamin D and carry out gluconeogenesis if needed, which is the production of creating glucose. Uh, kidneys are part of the urinary system, which also includes your ureters, which transport urine from the kidney to the bladder. The bladder is the storage for the urine, and then the urethra transports urine to the exterior of the body. So just take a moment, pause the lecture, um, and review this anatomy of the urinary system. Here's a look at a cadaver view. And here's the gross anatomy of the kidneys that I'll go over relatively quickly because you should have gone over this in anatomy. Um, one thing to point out in bold, your adrenal glands sit on top of each kidney. They have a convex lateral service and a concave medial service um, where the hilum leads to the internal space called the sinus. And all of the ureters, blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves enter and exit the kidney at the hilum. This is where the kidneys sit um, and where they sit uh, next to which ribs. There's three layers of supporting tissue around the kidney, the fascia, um, the fat capsule, and then the fibrous capsule, which is a transparent capsule that prevents the spread of infection to the kidney. And here's just a look at a cross-section view, a transverse section of where the kidneys lie um, in what we call the retroperitoneal, so outside this peritoneal cavity on the back side of the wall. Um, the upper parts of both kidneys are protected by the thoracic cage. This is fat. And the lower parts of the kidneys are susceptible to trauma, such as in falls, motor vehicle accidents, accidents, contact sports, injuries. Think of boxers. Um, you might hear getting in a kidney shot. The renal artery is especially vulnerable to in injury from rapid deceleration during car crashes, which could lead um, to lacerations or thromboses, a torn or a blood clot. And hematuria is blood in the urine, and that's an important sign of such trauma. Normally, blood should not be filtered out through the urine. And if you see blood in the urine, that could be um, a sign for trauma. Surgical treatment is probably required. Here's the internal gross anatomy of the kidney. Uh, there's a renal cortex, um, which is kind of the outer superficial re region. And then the renal medulla is deep to the cortex. That's composed of cone-shaped um, medulla or renal pyramids. Um, there's a papilla, which is the tip of the pyramid that points internally. The renal pyramids are separated by renal columns. Um, and the lobe is just the medullary pyramid and all its surrounding tissue. And there are about eight lobes per kidney. The renal pelvis is the funnel-shaped tube continuous with the ureter. Um, this funnel system kind of comes from minor calyxes, which collect urine draining from the um, papilla of the pyramid. Two or more minor calyxes come together to form a major calyx, which are areas that collect urine from the minor calyxes and then drain urine into the renal pelvis. And the renal pelvis exits out of the ureter. So I want you to know this general flow of urine um, basic anatomy there. And here's just another quick review of the internal anatomy of the kidney. Uh, Pyelitis is infection of the renal pelvis and calyxes. So it, that's an itis word. Pyelonephritis is infection or inflammation of the entire kidney. Um, it could be caused by fecal bacteria entering the urinary tract. Severe cases can cause swelling of the kidney, um, abscess formation and pus filling the pelvis, and in left untreated kidney damage could result. Uh, normally it's treated successfully with antibiotics. So here's the blood and nerve supply to the kidney. Uh, kidneys cleanse all the blood and adjust its composition. So the kidneys have a very rich blood supply. Renal arteries deliver about one fourth of cardiac output to the kidneys each minute. 
which is about 1200 milliliters. That's a lot of blood going to your kidneys to be filtered. Here's the arterial flow of that blood um, going from renal to segmental, interlobar, arcuate, and cortical radiate, interlobular. These are just arteries. The venous flow, the names are similar, but they go in the opposite direction, draining blood out of the kidneys after it's been filtered um, back to the venous um, circulatory system. The nerve supply is via sympathetic fibers from the renal plexus. So here's a look at the blood vessels of the kidney and where they all originate initially um, from the renal artery. Here is a look at the blood vessels of the kidney and what they're all called. You'll notice the afferent and efferent arterial are the ones that go into and out of the glomerulus. Um, and the glomerulus is what is the big filtering system of the kidney. Okay, so the nephrons are the structural and functional unit that form urine. There's a, about a million per kidney. There's two parts, the renal corpuscle, which contains the glomerulus, which is the first filtration part of the urinary system, and then the renal tubule, where different ions and electrolytes will be either reabsorbed back into the bloodstream or secreted back in to fill the urine filtrate. The glomerulus then is a part of the renal corpuscle. It's a tuft of capillaries composed of fenestrated endothelium, which just means these capillaries have pores or holes in them, and it allows for very efficient filtrate formation. And filtrate is the word that we give to the plasma-derived fluid that renal tubules pro process to form urine. So filtrate is formed in the glomerulus once the blood flows through it. The glomerular capsule then we'll talk about, um, it's also called the Bowman's capsule. The Bowman's capsule is cup-shaped hollow structure surrounding the glomerulus. It consists of a parietal and visceral layer um, the visceral layer is what will cling to the glomerular capillaries. It has branching epithelial podocytes with little foot processes that cling to the basement membrane. And there's uh, slits called filtration slits between the foot processes that allow the filtrate to pass into the capsular space. So here's the parietal layer, parietal layer, and then the visceral layer contains these podocytes um, with the fenestrated endothelium of the glomerulus below. The renal tubule then is about um, three centimeters long. It consists of a single layer of epithelial cells and each region has a very unique histology and function. Uh, the three parts, if you remember, are the proximal convoluted tubule closest to the renal corpuscle, the nephron loop, also called the loop of Henle, it goes down and up, and then the distal convoluted tubule is furthest from the renal corpuscle and the distal convoluted tubule will drain into the collecting duct. So the proximal convoluted tubule contains cuboidal cells with dense microvilli helping to increase surface area. Um, the PCT functions in reabsorption and secretion. And this is a look at the histology of the proximal convoluted tubule. The nephron loop called the loop of Henle, it has a descending and an ascending limb. The proximal part is the, the descending limb will be continuous with that proximal convoluted tubule. And the distal portion is also called the descending thin limb because it is much thinner and it's made of simple squamous epithelium. The ascending limb has a thick and thin portion uh, made up of cuboidal or columnar cells. And here's the nephron loop and the histology, uh, what the cells that make up that loop look like. The distal convoluted tubule then are cuboidal cells with very few microvilli. It functions more in secretion so secreting electron, electrolytes and ions back into the filtrate than reabsorption and it's confined to the cortex. And here's the look at the distal convoluted tubule and its histology and cells. Here's the renal cortical tissue, um, just a real histological look underneath the microscope of what it all looks like. You can kind of see the nice glomerulus there, the capsule space um, in the proximal convoluted tubule. So then the collecting ducts, there's Mommy, two cell types, Mommy, the principal this, cells. Mommy, I think I have news. I, I think that I have a news too. Yeah, thanks. And that was my daughter, Nora. Uh, there's two types of cells in the collecting ducts, the principal cells, which maintain water and sodium balance and intercalated cells. 
Uh, there's two types, A and B, and they both just help to maintain acid-base balance of the blood. Then the collecting ducts receive filtrate from many nephrons, which run through the medullary pyramids. And this is what gives the pyramids like a striped appearance. The ducts will eventually fuse together to deliver urine through the papillae into the minor calyxes. So this is just a good review um, of this kind of system, zooming in on the glomerulus with the afferent, efferent arterial, and then the process of where filtrate goes, first through the proximal convoluted tubule, down and up the nephron loop, through the distal convoluted tubule, and then into the collecting duct. There's two types of nephrons, cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. Um, you can kind of read through those cortical and juxtamedullary nephrons and their blood uh, vessels. So these blood vessels, um, will the blood capillaries will surround different parts of the tubule system to help with absorption, reabsorbing things back into the bloodstream or secreting ions and electrolytes back into um, the urine filtrate. Here are the renal tubules that are associated uh, with two capillary beds, the glomerulus and the peritubular capillaries. And the juxtamedullary nephrons are associated with this long vasa recta bed of capillaries, which surrounds the nephron loop. So the glomerulus then, um, these are capillaries specialized for filtration. The afferent arterial enters the glomerulus and leaves via the efferent arterial. Blood pressure in the glomerulus is extremely high because the afferent arterials which bring in the blood are larger in diameter and the efferent arterials are incredibly much smaller in diameter, so this provides a backup of pressure which allows for efficient filtration. Arterials are extremely high resistance vessels. The peritubular capillaries um, are low pressure porous capillaries that are adapted for absorption of water and solutes. They arise from efferent arterials and they will cling to adjacent renal tubules in the cortex and eventually empty into venules. And then the vasa recta are long, thin-walled vessels parallel to the long nephron loops. Um, they will function in the formation of concentrated urine. And this just shows um, the glomerulus and then the wide efferent arterial, which is supplying um, the glomerulus and the much narrower efferent arterial, which is draining from it. And again, what we're describing here are all these capillary beds, first talking about the glomerulus, and then the peritubular capillaries, which sub surround um, the tubular system, and the vasa recta, which surrounds the nephron loop in the juxtaglomerular nephrons. Each nephron has one juxtaglomerular complex, which involves distal portions of the ascending limb of the nephron loop and the afferent arterial. And this, is, this complex is very important in regulating the rate of filtration formation and blood pressure. There's three cell populations seen in this complex. And I want you guys to know these. The macula densa um, contains chemoreceptors that sense the sodium chloride content of the filtrate. And then we have juxtaglomerular or JG cells. Um, these are enlarged smooth muscle cells of the arterial and they act as mechanoreceptors to sense blood pressure in the afferent arterial. Um, what the granular cells are important for is they contain an enzyme called renin. And then the extra glomerular cells, um, they may pass signals between the two previous cell types. So that's this juxtaglomerular complex. Um, this is the juxtaglomerular complex of a nephron. You can see these three different types of cells, uh, the macula densan cells of the ascending limb of the nephron loop. You can see the granular cells and then the extraglomerular cells kind of acting as a um, connection between the two. So this juxtaglomerular complex um, kind of surrounds this ascending nephron loop and also are the distal convoluted tubule and the afferent arterial. The physiology of the kidney then, um, which we'll talk about basically is the process of forming urine. About 180 liters of fluid is processed daily, but only about one and a half liters of urine is formed. The kidney's main function is to filter your plasma um, up to 60 times a day. It consumes about 20 to 25% of oxygen at rest. 
and filtrate produced by the glomerular filtration is basically blood plasma minus all the proteins. So you never want proteins to get in your filtrate or urine. If you do, that's usually a, um, a cause for alarm, often seen in diabetes. So urine is then produced from filtrate. It's less than 1% of the original filtrate. And that's because what is initially filtrated through the glomerulus will get reabsorbed back into those blood capillaries whether it's the vasa recta or the peritubular capillaries that we talked about. The urine will contain metabolic wastes, urea, um, and any other unneeded substance like any sort of drug or toxin. So these are the three main processes that are involved in urine formation and adjustment of blood composition. And this is kind of where the rest of the kind of this end, part A and part B, will talk about these processes. Glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. Um, I want you to have a good understanding of these three processes, maybe not every single detail involved in each, but knowing that these are the three main processes involved in your information and how we um, adjust blood composition. So glomerular filtration produces cell and protein free filtrate. Uh, tubular reabsorption selectively returns 99% of substances from the filtrate back to the blood in the renal tubules and the collecting ducts. So when we talk about reabsorption, things are getting reabsorbed back from the tubules back, back into the bloodstream. And then tubular secretion selectively moves substances from the blood to back into the filtrate in the renal tubules and the collecting ducts. Um, so here's a look about where glomerular filtration occurs in the glomerulus. And then tubular reabsorption will be everything taken out of the filtrate back into the blood capillaries. And tubular secretion is when substances are taken from the blood and put back into the filtrate to form urine. So step one, glomerular filtration is a passive process, meaning no energy, no ATP is required. It forces fluids and solutes through the filtration membrane uh, due to hydrostatic pressure and no reabsorption into the capillaries of the glomerulus occurs. So everything gets filtered out at this point. There's a very porous membrane between the blood and the interior glomerular capsules. It allows water and solutes to pass through, um, but no plasma proteins, no cells. It contains these three layers, fenestrated endothelium. Fenestrated means there's holes in it. The basement membrane, which kind of fuses the two layers together, and then foot processes of the podocytes with filtration slits um, or spaces between them. So here's just a good look at the filtration membrane um, showing the capillaries in the glomerulus with the podocytes, and the little podocytes feet have spaces between them that make the slits uh, that all the filtrate can pass through. And here's kind of an in-depth, a zoomed in look at that filtration membrane with the uh, foot processes of the podocytes. And this is an actually a microscopic look at it, kind of cool to see again in real life and not just someone actually made up the picture. Okay, this shows you the filtration membrane in a little more artistic rendition, much more simply put with the layers of the glomerular capillaries and showing the blood flow in which direction they will go through to create filtrate in the capsular space. Uh, macromolecules will get stuck in the filtration membrane and they'll be engulfed by glomerular mesangial cells. This will allow molecules only smaller than three nanometers to pass through. So water, glucose, amino acids, and other nitrogenous wastes are the only things that can get through. Plasma proteins will remain in the blood to maintain an osmotic pressure gradient. And that just helps to prevent loss of all water to the capsular space. Uh, the proteins in the filtrate indicate um, any sort of membrane problem, usually at the glomerulus level, meaning um, they were allowing substances too large to pass through. So we have forces that promote filtration. Um, the chief force pushing water solutes out of the blood is this hydrostatic pressure. And it's quite high. It's about 55 millimeters of mercury, which is a lot higher seen in most other capillaries. And again, what I want you guys to know is that the reason for this great pressure is that the efferent arterial is a high resistance vessel with a much smaller um, diameter than the afferent arterial. And that just um, builds up kind of a backlog of pressure behind it. Um, there's also inward pressure. 
um, due to pressure from the capsular space capillaries. And then the net filtration pressure just sums up the net um, filtration pressure and the net of forces of this filtration. And this net filtration pressure is the main controllable factor determining what we call glomerular filtration rate, which we'll talk about. Um, so this just shows the net, the, the pressure and how we get this net filtration pressure, subtracting the outward forces from the inward forces. I don't want you guys know to, to know too much of that, but just that this um, glomerular hydrostatic pressure is so great because the efferent arterial has a much smaller diameter, which just leads to kind of a backup of pressure. So the glomerular filtration rate, this is important to know, this is just the volume of filtrate um, formed per minute by both kidneys. And normally it's about 120 to 125 milliliters per minute. And it's proportional to the net filtration pressure, the surface area available for filtration and the filtration membrane permeability. Um, it's a lot more permeable than other capillaries are. Constant GFR is extremely important as it allows kidneys to make the filtrate and maintain extracellular homeostasis. Um, so the goal of any sort of local intrinsic control in terms of how the, um, your kidneys auto regulate themselves will try to maintain a constant glomerular filtration rate. Um, this rate affects systemic blood pressure An increased rate will cause increased urine output, which will lower blood pressure and vice versa. And the goals of ex extrinsic controls are to maintain systemic blood pressure. The intrinsic controls are all the renal autoregulation. Um, there's two types, myogenic mechanism and the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism, just the ways the kidneys themselves maintain their autoregulation of the glomerular filtration rate. You guys can read through these mechanisms um, of intrinsic regulation of the kidneys, uh, but I won't ask you specific questions about them. And then the extrinsic controls are neural and hormonal mechanisms. They will override renal controls if blood volume needs to be increased. So sympathetic nervous system, um, under normal conditions at rest, renal blood vessels will be dilated. Um, so renal autoregulation mechanisms will prevail. And under abnormal conditions like extremely low um, extracellular fluid, low blood pressure, norepinephrine will be released to try to vasoconstrict. Um, the arteries, which will increase blood pressure, constricting of the afferent arterioles will decrease glomerular filtration rate. And because blood isn't going into your kidneys, overall blood systemic volume and pressure will increase. The renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism is the main mechanism for increasing blood pressure. Um, and I do want you guys to understand this. There's three pathways to renin release. Um, it's a direct stimulation of granular cells. It's stimulated by activated macula densa cells when sodium chloride concentration is low or reduced stretch of the granular cells. So this is the glomerular filtration rate in the kidneys. We'll talk a little bit more about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, um, but the main goal of this hormonal renin angiotensin aldosterone system is to increase blood pressure. Other factors affecting GFR, renal cells can affect GR. Um, they can make their own locally acting angiotensinogen too. Um, and their purpose is to um, vasoconstrict the arteries. And here's just a summary of regulation of glomerular filtration rate. Um, outside of this graph, I probably won't ask you anything else um, about regulating glomerular filtration rate. So you can take a minute and just look at that too. Uh, and Nuria is abnormally low urine output. It may indicate that the glomerular blood pressure is too low to cause filtration. Um, it can be from kid nephrons not functioning, like in acute nephritis, inflammation of nephrons, a bad transfusion reaction, or some sort of crush or crash injury. And that's part A, and I'll go ahead and make part B a separate recording, because I kind of had to stop and start here. Sorry if it was a little choppy. Um, I hope you guys are doing well and we'll finish with part B um, next time.